go where they wanted to, when they wanted to. I wish that I could do the same. Birds uh, have a mobility, a freedom most of us would give our souls to have. A person who uh, is thinking of aesthetics would argue that they are attractive, uh, they have interesting forms, they have uh, interesting movements, pleasant songs, but I think that's a rather superficial explanation. I think basically there's something a little bit more subtle than that. I think it's this uh, reflection of vitality they have, this incisive kind of movement the quality of life that they demonstrate. They're very alive, there's no question about that. But when I was uh, very young, 60 years ago when I started bird watching at the age of 11, um, bird watchers were rare. In fact, uh, I was considered uh, pretty much of an oddball. But today it's the person who does not have at least uh, some interest in the outdoors, who is not, who does not have at least a peripheral interest in birds, is the one who's labeled a kook. Why birds, uh, one would naturally ask. I think mostly because they're numerous, they're visible, there is great variety. I think there is no better entree to the outdoors and knowledge of the environment than, than bird watching. A person who is uh, starting bird watching uh, should have three things. First, a um, good pair of binoculars. It doesn't have to be uh, the best pair in the world. A pair that magnifies at least six times, six, seven, or eight times, I think, is, is about the best magnification. Because a bird that is magnified by six times is six times as handsome, you can really see what it looks like with binoculars. Then um, uh, one should have a field guide. A field guide is very important because uh, the field guide gives the appearances of birds as they appear in the, uh, in the distance, not as they are in the hand. And most of us see birds uh, at a distance, at least 100 yards away, perhaps as much as half a mile away. And the field guide is intended to point out the one, two, or three things that distinguishes that bird at a distance. Field marks are those marks by which uh, one bird can be readily told from its neighbors or, or from other similar species. The points, the one, two, or three points that uh, quickly identify them without having to see everything on the bird. You don't have to see the little black lines on the throat of a robin or the three broken white spots around the eye to know it's a robin. The fact that it's a dark back bird with a red breast is all that you need to know. Uh, many other birds are not quite as simple as robins, but uh, white bands on the tail, um, solid wings, patterned wings, striped crowns, wing bars, lack of wing bars, all these things are important. By knowing what to look for, what is distinctive about a species, uh, you can very easily gain a competence in identifying birds rather quickly. In addition to uh, a good field guide, it's very important to have, uh, have a friend who is, uh, has some competence in identifying birds. Of course, uh, many towns have local nature clubs or Audubon societies. Some of them have field trips, and uh, you have the benefit of friends and others who know the birds. One of Roger's closest bird-watching friends is his wife, Jenny. They work together on the latest field guide, and she was responsible for preparing the nearly 400 range maps for the book. Listen, hold it. Which one? There's a tanager, I think. Did you oh, get it? Oh, I'd love to see him. On the top of that tree. No, no, about halfway up. They usually go for the top. The art of telling birds apart in the wild is quite easy when you look at it as a process of elimination. Most of the common species found in North America can be eliminated immediately by the time of year and the place where the bird is seen. What part of the country are you in? Is it summer in the Northeast? Winter on the Gulf Coast? Are you in the mountains? At the Atlantic seashore? or a Pacific woodland. And where is the bird? Is it up in a tree? On the ground? Or on or near the water? With a little practice, you can reduce to a manageable number the possible group or family the bird could be. Then there are some simple questions you can ask which will help you get more specific. First, what is the bird's size? Compare a new bird with some familiar yardstick so that you can say smaller than a crow, about the same size as a robin. Other nearby birds can give good size reference too. 
Next, what is its shape? Is it plump like a starling? Or slender like a mockingbird? And what shape is its bill? Small and fine like a warbler? Stout and short like a seed cracking sparrow? Dagger shaped like an egret? Or hook tip like the birds of prey? Many birds have specialized bills which have evolved to help them survive and which can help you with identification. Pelicans have a pouch at the bottom of their bills which they use as a sort of dip net for fishing. The woodcock has a long slender bill used for probing in the dirt for insects. Woodpeckers have strong chisel-like bills, an essential tool for their distinctive lifestyle. The black skimmer's lower mandible is longer than the upper one, enabling it to scoop up organisms from the water while flying. Any type of characteristic you can see quickly can help you identify birds. And sometimes a bird even gets its name from its crossbill, grosbeak, or spoonbill. Next look at the tail. Is it deeply forked like a swallow-tailed kite or a barn swallow? Squared off like a flycatcher? Or pointed like a morning dove? And how does it hold its tail? Down like a kingbird? Or does it cock its tail like a wren? Sometimes the tail alone will identify the bird, such as the scissor tail flycatcher. If a bird is in flight, there are often other hints to identification. What shape are the wings? Are they rounded like a grouse? Or sharply pointed like a tern? Notice whether the bird glides or soars on long wings. Move straight ahead with quick wing beats of shorter ones. Or maybe it even hovers. And notice other behavior. Does it climb trees? If so, does it hop like the black and white warbler? Move in jerks with its head up like a woodpecker? Or does it go down the tree head first like a nuthatch? If it's in the water, does it wade? If so, is it large and long-legged like an egret, or small like a sandpiper, or other so-called shorebird? If it is a shorebird, notice whether it probes in the mud or picks at things. Is there any other unusual behavior? Does it swim? If so, does it look like a duck? Or is it bigger like a goose or swan? or smaller like a coot. If it is a duck, does it dive like a deep water duck or feed on the surface like a dabbling duck? Learning how to look at things and what to look for is the key to bird identification. When you know where a bird is, then note size, shape, bill type, tail, and wings. And notice general behavior patterns. You can zero in on the category of bird you're looking at and eliminate the others. In the field guide, uh, to help the beginner, I have divided uh, birds into eight basic categories, visual categories. The swimmers, by that I mean the ducks and the duck-like birds. The uh, aerialists, those with superb flight, particularly water birds, such as the gulls, the terns, and the gull-like birds. Then the long-legged waders, the herons and the cranes, the bitterns, then the smaller waders, such as the sandpipers and the plovers, the fowl-like birds, the grouse, the quail, and the other rather chicken-like birds, the birds of prey, that uh, includes the hawks, the eagles, and the owls, and then that uh, miscellaneous group of land birds that we might call the non-passerine land birds, which includes things like kingfishers and cuckoos and uh, hummingbirds. And finally, the passerine or perching birds, birds such as the robins, the sparrows, and the warblers, the other land birds that perch. 
by uh, placing them into these eight groups, uh, I think it uh, helps a great deal. For, from that point on, we can narrow them down into families and then species. Once you know the category, you can concentrate on special features. Some birds can be identified by color alone, but most are not that easy. The most important aids are what Peterson calls field marks, the trademarks of nature. Look for distinctive spots, marks, or patches on the bird. Are there streaks or spots on the breast, throat, belly, or head? Does the bird have a crest or crown? Are there eye stripes or rings around the eye? Are there wing bars or other patterns on the wings? By combining the clues that two or three field marks can give you, naming the bird can be easier. For instance, size, shape, and the short bill tell us this bird is a sparrow, and you can easily see its wing bars and rusty cap. But there are several rusty cap sparrows, so which one is this? Only when you notice the dark spot on the breast can you identify it certainly as a tree sparrow. By looking this closely, you can tell the difference between this species and other sparrows, like the white crown sparrow with its white head stripes and plain breast. Or the white-throated sparrow with its white throat, wing bars, white head stripes, and yellow forehead patch. Let's try a few more examples. This bird is on the water, so it's surely a swimmer. Its size, shape, and tip-up feeding behavior tell us it's a dabbling duck, but which one? Notice the white neck stripe and the long pointed tail. These field marks are easy to see. A check in the field guide tells us this duck is a pintail. It is quite different from other dabbling ducks like the mallard, the American widgeon, the green winged teal, the blue winged teal, or the cinnamon teal. What about a land bird? It's unlikely that you'd see this bird in the eastern half of North America, so knowing this will help with identification. It looks a little like a blue jay, and it has the distinguishing crest of a blue jay. But looking closely, you will see that it is a very darkly colored bird, and a glance in a western field guide will identify it as Stellar's jay, quite a different bird from a blue jay. Blue jays, or tanagers, or robins, are rather simple to identify, and stopping with these birds will leave many of the birds you see unidentified. Many birds are far more challenging, depending on their sex or the time of year you see them. Many males have totally different plumages from their mates, and sometimes even look like different species. A cardinal female isn't the bright red we associate with the male, And while a male red-winged blackbird fits his name exactly, the female isn't even a black bird and has only a faint hint of red on her wings. Often you will not have time to get a good look at a bird, especially a smaller one. This is why, in addition to looking carefully, it is just as important to listen. Voice is very important when uh, identifying birds. Take the uh, several thrushes, for example. They look very much alike, the five species of brown thrushes, but each one has a very distinctive song. The wood thrush with its round, full notes, the very uh, wheeling downward, the uh, Swainson's thrush wheeling upward. Each one of the uh, five thrushes has a song that is very distinctive, and yet uh, most glimpses of these thrushes in the woods, uh, they look rather alike. And the same is true of most birds. Uh, if you know the song, so you can identify the bird very quickly, particularly with warblers. You'd scarcely know they were around if they didn't sing. And their, their voices are distinctive, even though they may look rather alike, some of them. Same is true of sparrows. Most sparrows are little brown jobs, but their, their voices are, are distinctive. And usually the habitat is fairly distinctive. Between habitat and voice, you have uh, two very good reference points. Really stopping to listen can be one of the true pleasures of bird watching.
While sounds can give tremendous clues to bird identification, even these can be tricky, since one species can have several different songs, calls, or scolds. Learning these can increase the fun and challenge of bird watching. Of course, some birds say their names. Whippoorwill obviously seems to say Whippoorwill. Chickadee says Chickadee. Phoebe says Phoebe. They say their names, but uh, a great many other birds, it's a matter of uh, inventing a phrase that will remind you or act as a memory jog. I like the toy one that says, drink your tea. Yes, drink your tea. Of course, to uh, some other ears, it might sound like something else, but such words are memory jogs. They certainly are helpful. But how do you bring these sounds and sights into your life? You can attract birds to your home or yard by providing the food, water, or shelter that they like. In practically any environment, a seed bird feeder will attract a variety of species. Insect eaters like woodpeckers will be attracted to suet. And the hummingbirds will come to brightly colored feeders dispensing sweetened water. Artificial nesting materials like string or cotton will be actively used by many birds. And several species will nest in man-made shelters, either simple or complex. Most birds will be attracted to a pool, puddle, or bird bath, but they won't always just be drinking. <laughs> The most effective way to begin bird watching is simply to go to a place where birds are and just sit or stand quietly. This could be at a backyard puddle or a bird bath far from home. Roger Peterson has literally gone to the ends of the earth to find birds. And the staunch little residents of Antarctica have won his heart. I enjoy penguins uh, tremendously, I suppose because they are uh, so far out in the bird world. It's not because they look like little humans. I, I know that's what appeals to so many people. They're not little clowns in baggy pants. But they, they lead very serious lives and they're very good at it. They're very earnest creatures. They may have a droll appearance, but uh, they are certainly experts at survival in some of the harshest climates in the world. And to me, uh, they are very admirable birds. When one watches birds for a long time, he begins to think uh, more seriously about their way of life, how they do these things, the extraordinary abilities they have, senses that they've had that uh, we either lost or never attained. They, they are simply marvelous creatures. and. Uh, I think this is why so many people these days are taking to bird watching. They're, they're discovering this. Very often they discover birds through a friend, a friend who opens their eyes in some way. Once a person's eyes are opened, uh, why the potential is unlimited. There is no one single way to watch birds, no right way or wrong way. Some people may simply confine their bird watching to the garden or the kitchen windows, other people to the duck blind, perhaps. Or um, the hardcore bird watcher can start with the owls and end with the owls and make a long day of it. There are many ways to, uh, to pursue this hobby, this wonderful hobby of bird watching. The important thing is to uh, get out there and learn to see, to look, and to enjoy. As you come to know the birds, you will witness a remarkable diversity of behavior that will make bird watching more than just keeping lists. You can watch the annual reproductive cycle as the nests of early spring become the homes of midsummer, and the goslings of July become the adults of approaching winter. 
you will come to have your favorites too, as new colors, new sounds, and new behavior become old friends. And you will come to learn that free as a bird is more than just a cliche. It's a way of life. Watching birds can become a hobby, a sport, and maybe even a passion. You are a bird watcher. You have been seduced.